Absolutely. Uh, Madam President, thank you for the courtesy and invitation to join you today. Uh, I am surrounded by so many who have been in public office, uh, or presently public office, that if I could just like to acknowledge them. Uh, of course, uh, my dear friend Ed McMahon, Karen Bentley, Lynn Wheeler, uh, David Erdman, Eric Davis, Eddie Peacock, uh, John Tabor, and John Lasker. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, we are all indebted because of folks like you who care enough about our region, about our state, and our country to get out there. Uh, I can fully appreciate uh, the work that all of y'all have done, no matter what size of the party that you're in. Uh, either you're, you're there for the right reasons. You're there because you care. Tony Zeiss, I think of you and all that you've done for our region, remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Uh, he is the energizer rabbit, if there is one in charge. <laughs> well, uh, my time in Washington is uh, remind me somewhat of a, the story about Albert Schweitzer. As Albert Schweitzer would, was going through Europe on a train, and he was sitting on the train, he just it, it boarded, and the conductor came down the road and he was punching tickets. And frantically, uh, Dr. Schweitzer started looking for his ticket. He was up, below, around, and just painting. And the conductor came up and said, Dr. Schweitzer, and he said, sir, tell me, what, what is the problem? He said, I cannot find my ticket. And he, he said, well, look at me, so are you not Albert Schweitzer? He said, well, yes. He said, well, Dr. Schweitzer, you just relax. Enjoy this ride. We are so honored to have you on this train. He said, well, okay. And so conductor left, train continued, and uh, made another stop. More people got on the train. Conductor came down, started punching tickets again, and here was Dr. Schweitzer. Absolutely panicked, looking all over, frantically trying to find his ticket. Conductor came up and said, Dr. Schweitzer, what, what seems to be the problem? He said, I can't find my ticket. He said, Dr. Schweitzer, I said, we want you to relax. We are just honored to have you here. We know who you are. He said, well, I too know who I am. I just don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Do you feel that way about Washington, D.C.? <laughs> we sure know who we are. Right? But do we have a clue where we're going? You think not. Uh, during the course, of after the time that I was elected, prior to the time I was sworn in, there were a series of uh, briefings for new members. There's 85 new members, uh, freshmen, Democrat and Republican. And they invited us to a number of briefings in, in uh, Washington, and Harvard, uh, Williamsburg. And we spent a lot of time together and got to know each other very, very well. But in these briefings, we, we heard a lot of data, from a lot of experts on the economy and foreign policy. And what I'd like to do very briefly is go through with you just some of the information that we heard real quickly, and then I'm gonna kind of condense this in my talk. This just gives you an idea of the, uh, each, man, each American's publicly held debt and how it skyrocketed, your participation in that. Right now it's 36,000, by 36 it'll be 135,000. Okay, well, did I press them too many? All right, good. Uh, this is how much a typical family would have spent, uh, equivalent to our $3.6 trillion budget. Uh, the lower level shows our actual budget of an actual family, and the part of gold shows what it would be if we spent at the level that the federal government spends. So our participation in the $16 trillion debt is $325,000 per family. Okay, this uh, shows uh, each American's publicly share of, of the debt, how it's skyrocketing. Again, by 2036, 135000 Well, am I moving forward? You move. There you go. I'm gonna let you do it. Um, te te technology is very weak here. Uh, Here's our current tax rates, 35% uh, being the highest bracket. If to, to adjust the tax rate to address the present and close the deficit would have to be 166%. Uh, by 2050, it would be 246%, so economically not feasible. All right, here's our marginal tax rates required to balance the budget. This is all the weights of the tax burden. And you can see the lowest bracket, middle bracket, highest bracket. Again, you have to take uh, 
in the highest bracket by 2008, uh, it's we're at 35 percent. By 2050, 66 percent. By 2082, 88 percent. Living your paycheck. All right, keep going. Here's it. We have a 3.5 trillion dollar budget. About two and a half trillion is spent on titles. Here are the other areas that we spend. The terrorism, 150 billion. You can see proportionally uh, how much of our budget is related to entitlements. NASA, 17 billion. Corporation brother broadcasting that got a lot of attention in the campaign, uh, 445 million dollars. I don't think that's going to make any difference. But uh, uh, you know, the, the Constitution uh, states the only area that states clearly that the obligation of the federal government is to provide for the common defense. Our defense is now 90 percent of the present budget. That's all. Go ahead. All right, this is uh, the percentage of, again, involved in the entitlement program, 62 percent. Again, it's your 90 percent of national defense right there. All right. Here's the amount of, of deficit uh, related to Social Security, which you can see in 2010, we started going to the negative. Okay. And the impact of Medicare. This is the biggest factor related to the expansion of the budget and why we cannot achieve uh, our financial objectives the way they are. All right. Okay, we know about Greece and what's happened to collapse in Greece. By 2035, this is 20 short years away, America <coughs> propels past Greece in the uh, amount of uh, debt per GDP, 187 percent. That's pretty scary. All right. Well, that's just a picture used truly. We had a, uh, and, that, and that goes back to my comments. Thank you. That's enough. Um, during these events uh, and meetings, we had. The briefings for all the freshmen. That picture is a culmination of uh, what I started called United Solutions to address these center, clear center pictures of, of, of what is facing our country. I mean, the, the, lot, the big elephant in the room. And the debt affects everything. And we've heard that before, but you know, I wasn't hearing it until I got to Williamsburg and I mean, Peter Orzak spoke. Peter Orzak. Uh, was the budget writer for Mr. Obama for four years. Very bright guy. And he shared during his talk, he said, if we don't address the debt, we're going to collapse like Greece. And if we don't adjust entitlements, you're, not playing, you're playing games with the debt. It's no way you can get there. It's through revamping and restructuring Medicare and Social Security particularly. And Medicare being the, the most driving force in it. Medicare will be insolvent in 10 years. I think that 10 years won't be there for anybody financially. Social Security, as you saw in 2010, is already in the negative. Well, when Mr. Ozak said that, you know, I was alarmed because, frankly, I believe that. I hadn't been hearing it from anybody else. Um, the President had mentioned it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pelosi had it. Mr. Reid had it. Others. And so as my Democrat friends walked out of the room, and then I got to know very well. I asked them, I said, what do you think? Does this make sense to you? They said, absolutely. And yeah, numbers don't lie. And we formed this group called United Solutions that I co-chair with a Democrat <coughs> friend named Patrick Murphy from Florida. And uh, we wrote a letter to the president and to the congressional leadership imploring to address the debt because of the implications it has that are just so overwhelming on where we're headed as a nation. I had a general in my office uh, shortly before we voted on the sequester, all right, the, the lowering of the budget and the reduction. And he brought in two uh, majors with him. And they were highly decorated young men. You could tell they're very dedicated. And he said, Congressman, I just want you to know if we proceed through with these cuts, our military men and women could uh, be harmed and put in harm's way out on the field. And I thought, as he said that, about a young boy named Billy Armstrong. Billy Armstrong had been my, my guest for the, the uh, State of the Union message. My wife had given up her seat to go. We're all allowed to have one guest. So that this young man, who had been treated in our uh, Walter Mead, 
could join us. He'd been going through rehab there. And he came uh, to be with me, and I took him, I wheeled him around in his wheelchair to a bunch of receptions uh, prior to the uh, State of the Union. He met everybody he could want to meet. We had a grand time that he could watch. Of course, it's a historic event to be there and watch the President of the United States as we all stand and rise and honor him and this great country. And so as he, it, as the general spoke, I thought about Billy and all the Billy Armstrongs and all the families of the Billy Armstrongs and their dedication and the thousands of lives that have already been lost. And we talked some about Afghanistan and the progress there, what's going to happen. Um, and Karzai's gone, and we're gone. Potential collapse there. And I said, you know, General, I share deep, deep concern over the what will happen over our budget cuts. They're real. But my concern is just as great over where we're headed financially. Because if we don't address it, how do we protect even more of Billy Armstrong's in the future? How do we have economic provision there? Then we'll be in an even worse position. He said, sir, I understand. So our issues are, are serious. Uh, economically, very serious uh, on an international level. We saw it happen in Syria uh, the last couple of weeks. And the reality that there's very likelihood that there's uh, chemical uh, warfare capacity there, and you have uh, others, you, you have those who are there who would seek their own destruction, and they could get their hands on it. So all this to say is, uh, when you walk up those steps to the Capitol, those worn steps of stone, and you are so grateful for those who preceded you, who carry the burden for liberty, I mean, we are the lighthouse for liberty for the world, they looked at us as a Someone said earlier, I was in 100 plus countries with Dr. Bright. And every time I'd fly home, I would think, you know, God bless America. I'm so grateful to come back to this country and the freedoms that we share. But the burden and the reality of what we're addressing is going to require the best of all of us. And that's why I'm, I'm hopeful that our efforts in this bipartisan effort and other efforts that have taken place can come into fruition. Uh, without that, um, we're playing games. We're in, in essence, my feeling is we're straightening pictures while the house is burning down. And we have to be serious about these issues and again and, and do what we can to make them right. So Washington is a great place. People have asked me, you know, what's my impression of being there? My impression is I'm meeting a lot of quality people. I know there's a lot of people there who care who want to do the right thing on both sides of the aisle, frankly. I'm cherish my relationships with all of them. I, I get to know various people um, in different ways. I go to the gym, meet a different group of people there. In fact, my son shamed me into that. We were, I didn't want to go. Uh, I'm walking to the Capitol. This is the day of swearing in. And um, we catch up with Paul Ryan. And Paul was gracious. I met him on the campaign trail some. But he took pictures with the family, about 20 of us. Then my son says, Congressman, my dad wants to do P90X with you. <laughs> it is the most intensive program they made to life. I looked at my son, you know, I just uh, looked at him. He said, great, 6.30 more morning. Well, I, frankly, I've been down there with him and the guys, and uh, I don't do what they do, I promise you that. Uh, they're on 50 pounds, I got 15 pounds. But we're there working out. Uh, but there's a great group of people who are there really for the right reasons. There's one guy named Aaron Schock, but I'll tell you this funny story. Aaron is Mr. Fit. And he's been in the fitness magazines and GQ and everything. He's a congressman from, uh, from Illinois. And at the end of one of our workouts a couple weeks ago, um, he said, well, I'm really impressed how you kept up with us. I looked at him and I said, Aaron, really? Uh, I know better. That's like saying you don't sweat much for a fat boy. <laughs> but I'm there and I'm, I'm working at it. But there are people, you, you, you love them. You love the team you're with. 
Uh, and I, I do believe, my hope for this country is that is because we have people there who truly are, no matter what the media may say, they're there to do the right thing. And yes, politics does get in the way. We do have an election coming up in 2014. I don't know why the framers of the Constitution chose to have congressional races every two years. But uh, the, that does get in the way of the purity of politics. I mean, the purity of doing good public policy. And you just, you have to learn to work around it. So um, those issues will be resolved. I have every confidence that ultimately truth will prevail. I do stand on truth. I don't think you have to compromise your principles to build relationships with other people. Uh, I am who I am. I haven't vacillated. I haven't tried to change or morph into something else. I'm, I'm Robert Pittman, the same guy that I've been since I served Eddie back in the legislature in 2003. Uh, my views haven't changed. Uh, maybe I've learned to appreciate those I'm around more as I get a little bit older. Uh, but I, I do know that the, the folks who are there are there because they care. And we better do the right thing or the future is going to be bleak for us. So to that, I'd be glad to respond to any questions that you guys have. Yes, sir. What uh, as United Solutions? What have you What have y'all offered so far to correct what you? What you